Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending September 6th. First up, this was sent in by my friend Gary, Pseudo GJ is his YouTube channel, electric scooter design that makes a whole lot of sense. I'll show you a little bit of the video here of this thing. It also appeared at the Consumer Electronics Show in 2014. They started as a Kickstarter project to raise $300,000 and this is the Lit Motor Company. I had done an article on this before about the Lit Motors um, kind of hybrid two-wheeled car slash um, motorcycle. What it had was three gy gyros in the floor, so it would actually stay stabilized on two wheels. You didn't have to uh, put your feet out or anything like that. You could drive it just like a car. And in fact, they even did some tests with some small side crashes, and the thing stayed upright. Well, now they're working on this cargo type of scooter and uh, looks very interesting they did say in the consumer electronics show thing in 2014 that although they didn't make their goal they asked for 300,000 only raised 56,000 they're still going to go ahead but it's just going to be delayed now I noticed going on their site the CV1 which was the car version with the gyroscopes uh, it has a bunch of people laying down deposits but still no exact delivery date as far as when this is going to come out so I'm kind of thinking that this company maybe is looking more to be a development company and not so much a production company. They may make some limited runs of some things, but I think what they're looking more for is licensing of these things or licensing of at least parts of their idea. But this uh, cargo scooter is a really great idea. I mean, they originally came out with it to carry about 200 pounds, and I guess the uh, test models that they have actually functioning now can carry 300, and they say maybe even up to 400 pounds of cargo. It's just that after you get past 300, the handling and stuff like that may go may go down a little bit, but... Uh, overall, some really good ideas coming out of this company. I just hope they, if they do want to be a production company, they can really get something moving because since the Consumer Electronics Show, I still haven't seen a definite release date. Um, $5,000, probably not bad for a cargo scooter. Uh, one thing about the range, it's got a top speed of uh, 45 miles per hour, but a range of only 50 miles per hour. So even in the city, I would say you probably want something more like a 75, 100 mile range because you probably don't want to be charging it several times during the day, probably charging cycles and stuff like that, although they're not mentioned, probably are going to be rather long, but I'll put two links to two different, I'll put the link to the uh, article here from the BBC, and I'll put another link from the YouTube video um, from TechCrunch, uh, where they did an interview with them on C uh, Consumer Electronics Show 2014. Next up from IFL Science, and this is from 1954 Shadow, thank you Bob. Direct brain-to-brain -brain communication used in humans. Now, this was a non-invasive method to where they took two subjects and hooked them up to uh, EKG or EEGs, I should say. Yeah, hooked them up to EEGs. And what they did was they caused, uh, in the transmitting subject, they caused these uh, brain uh, flashes using phosphenes. I guess there's a thing when you, like, uh, go into a dark room and close your eye, you can actually press on your eye and get light flashes to happen. Um, I think I've seen stuff like that before myself, too, that you're like just because of the pressure and stuff like that. Well, somehow using this EEG, they're going to cause the transmitting subject to actually have these lights flash, and it will actually transmit the signal to the receiving person. And in this case, it was something like thousands of miles away. And they they don't say exactly how the this happened, but they actually transmitted a message of chow and another message of ola. So it must be a... They agreed to some kind of code with the light flashes or something like that, that maybe one flash means something, two flashes mean something else. They, they don't say that part, but they said, um, though there were minor errors during the trials, the system was on average over 90% accurate. There are other methods that would likely be more accurate but require embedding into the user. So, yeah, obviously your test subjects probably don't want to have their skulls opened up and have um, stuff like that uh, implanted in. But it is interesting because this is kind of based on the same kind of science, too. They have uh, done implants where people have volunteered to do that. In the case of handicapped people operating uh, computers or operating wheelchairs and stuff like that, they're more than willing to have these implants actually put into their head so that they can control either computers or devices. But um, this is some of the first experimentation with actually communicating thoughts from uh, one person to another one. I mean, I can ab absolutely see it in the future that somehow they could develop some kind of a helmet or something like that where you could wear a helmet and uh, the receiving person can wear another helmet and you could probably transmit thoughts pretty accurately. I mean, if this is just the first crude test and they're able to do this, I, I can see this happening in another 10 years or so. And next up, you probably have heard about it too, there was a private plane crash. A real estate developer and his wife 
were flying from Rochester, New York, down to Florida, and just like uh, happened in the case of the golfer, uh, um, his private plane, uh, what was his name, Payne, uh, golfer Payne Stewart, um, his plane depressurized too, ended up, uh, the plane just flew on an autopilot, and the pilot and everybody else in were either dead or unconscious. Well, this private plane crashed in Jamaica, and if you look on the news, you can probably, just like I did, I looked up on Google on the news, you can find more details about it, but the basic question I had was just a general question, and fortunately, I have a friend, Andrew R., that was a, that is a pilot for uh, Australia, major Australian airlines, and flies the big jets, and has been doing it quite a while, so I asked him a question about this, and here's my question. I just heard on the news about another private jet flying with a dead pilot and passengers due to oxygen loss. Do those planes not have the oxygen mass like I see on every major flight I've been on? What is happening here? And here's his answer. Now, obviously, it's total speculation. His answer could have everything to do with what happened on this particular flight or nothing to do with it, but this is his uh, speculation as a, a licensed pilot. Yeah, if they fly above 10,000 feet, the cockpit should have a quick release oxygen mask, not an automatic drop down type that the passengers have. I assume they have a warning system that indicates when pressurization fails. Maybe that system failed in that unfortunate aircraft. I'm not sure. Very sad. So uh, he gave me that message too that they obviously do. These pressurized private planes do have some system of being able to keep the pilots conscious even with oxygen loss. And I guess. In this case, there was uh, reports on the one news service about that the pilot had communicated with ground control and said something was wrong and he wanted to descend to a lower altitude, but they wouldn't let him do it because there was another airplane in that uh, spa airspace, so they didn't want to take the chance of a crash. So something went off. I, what, what would be the reason if he was aware that there was some kind of oxygen loss, he wouldn't put on an oxygen mask? That part nobody knows, I guess. I mean, there's no one left to ask. So it is, it's nice to have sources to go to for stuff like that. But I was just thinking if for some reason he was going to tell me, no, for some reason private planes don't really have to have oxygen masks or anything like that, I would be going, whoa, that does not make much sense at all. And last up, this is from Astronomy Magazine. Asteroid to safely pass close to Earth on Sunday. Probably about the time you're watching this or if you're watching it a little bit after Sunday afternoon. Possibly you will have missed it, but you wouldn't have been able to see it anyway without a telescope. This is a 60-foot-long asteroid, and it will be about one-tenth the distance from the Earth to the Moon. It will actually get fairly close to the geostationary uh, satellites that are at 22,000 feet, but it will be just a little farther away than that. And the asteroid is designated 2014 RC. It will safely pass close to Earth on Sunday, September 7th at 2.18 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The asteroid will be roughly over New Zealand. From its reflected brightness, astronomers estimate that the asteroid is about 60 feet meters or 20 meters in size. This is approximately what they think is about the size of that asteroid that exploded over Russia just uh, maybe, what was it, over a year ago and caused quite a bit of damage and stuff. So this is not an asteroid, even if it impacted us directly, that would be, uh, you know, destructive to life as we know it or changing the climate on Earth or anything like that. But if it did happen to explode over a large city, um, it's going to create quite a bit of damage and maybe some deaths. I mean, it, it injured quite a few people and created a lot of property damage over Russia when that um, asteroid exploded, and they ended up getting that on a lot of different video. And that's about it for this week. Um, all the links below to all the articles and everything. Take care. I will catch you guys next week.